All right, so hello everybody. Welcome to our uh, Center for AI Innovation uh, um, Research Seminars. Today, we are very happy to um, have um, uh, presenters from uh, uh, GraphCore uh, who will talk about their system, the, the design, the ideas behind it. Um, so the, uh, the presenter is uh, Saurabh uh, Kolkarni. Uh, he is uh, uh, a VP and GM uh, for the North America for GraphCore. Uh, he has a lot of experience, many years of experience working as the uh, senior design engineer and then a senior hardware architect at Intel, where he worked on the CPU design. Uh, he also has many years of experience at the Microsoft uh, in, the, in the cloud division and the AI systems technologies. And so now he is leading this effort at, at the Graphicore. And so we are, we are very, very pleased to have him uh, to uh, present um, about the latest uh, um, uh, developments uh, at Graphicore. So, Sarab, please take it from here. Sounds good. Thank you, Vlad, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody, uh, or, or good afternoon, <laughs> depending on where you are. Uh, as Vlad said, my name is Saurabh Kulkarni, uh, and I'm uh, VP and GM for the North America operations for GraphCore. Uh, to introduce GraphCore uh, to those in the audience who are not familiar, uh, GraphCore is an AI processor system and software company. Uh, we started by creating the intelligence processing unit, uh, which is an AI processor built with a keen focus on creating a highly uh, fine-grained parallel machine following the MIMD uh, architectural paradigm, uh, multiple instruction, multiple uh, data. Uh, and that was done with a particular emphasis on accelerating uh, machine intelligence workloads. Uh, and as you all know, uh, it is not enough to just build a processor. Uh, the software stack that enables developers uh, to use that processor uh, at the efficiency and scale that is required to run workloads uh, that are exploding rapidly, and also the scale-out systems uh, that enable uh, users to use the processor in large uh, hyperscale environments uh, are equally important. And that is exactly what uh, we started focusing on quite early in our journey. Uh, so now in the uh, third generation of our product, uh, we're fast evolving to become a processor software and systems company. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, large-scale AI uh, and, and spend some time describing some parallelization techniques uh, that will allow us to map these large models efficiently on hyperscale systems. Uh, the baseline model uh, architecture that will be used for the purposes of this ta talk will be the transformer, uh, just because it is so prevalent these days. But that's just an exemplar uh, to make the point on several concepts. Uh, the, the, the notions and the general ideas are uh, very, very generalizable, uh, which means that they can be used uh, for other model architectures too. Uh, I'll start with the problem statement and framing the problem, uh, going over some industry trends uh, that we are seeing based on our conversations uh, with uh, some key customers and also a bunch of publications that have recently uh, come out, um, a lot of them being very, very noteworthy. Uh, after that, I'll talk about some of the challenges involved uh, in running at scale, uh, because the world of AI is quickly evolving to be one where it is going to be all about uh, scale and flexibility. Uh, so these challenges are both from the computational side of things and also from uh, memory. Uh, that will lead into some uh, techniques that people commonly resort to for model decomposition strategies, especially when it comes to large models, and how one goes about mapping those models uh, to hundreds of thousands of accelerators. And then finally, I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, GraphCore technology uh, and how we at GraphCore aim uh, to address these challenges. Uh, I'll be happy to take a few questions uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, I'll, I'll also leave my contact information uh, so that if uh, people who are interested want to get in touch, uh, they're more than welcome to do so uh, even after the talk. Uh, so with that context, let's uh, jump right in. Uh, to begin with, uh, here are some observations uh, on trends and key tenets for designing AI systems at scale uh, that we at DraftCore try to adhere to. Uh, now, these are just guiding principles. Uh, a lot of what we do is driven by customer input. 
but these points kind of capture the gist of what we have been observing on a consistent basis over the past few months, years. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we are still in what we uh, refer to as the capability phase of AI, meaning uh, that we are nowhere close to being mature from a technology point of view when it comes to AI, both software and hardware. Uh, the application domains where AI can be applied to uh, are also still uh, being discovered. Uh, and I'd say that the, even that discovery process has maybe barely passed its infancy phase. So, so very early on, um, in our opinion. So needless to say uh, that the rate of innovation in algorithms, model architectures, model mapping and optimization techniques, uh, scheduling tools, job orchestration frameworks, MLOps, all of that continues to remain very, very high. Uh, the, uh, as an example, uh, the human brain uh, has close to uh, 100 billion uh, neurons and close to uh, 100 trillion synapses, which can be loosely coupled to uh, this notion of uh, the number of trainable parameters in a deep neural network model. So that, that just sets the stage for what the scale we are looking at for uh, model sizes. Uh, whereas in reality, uh, in practical terms, uh, in today's world, we barely deal with uh, models that, uh, in a realistic sense, uh, models that surpass a, a few billion uh, parameters. So we still have a long ways to go. Uh, it is becoming very clear though that uh, terascale models or models with trillions of parameters will be necessary for uh, superhuman or AI. And when I say superhuman AI, I, I definitely don't imply uh, AI transcending human capabilities anytime soon in all functions uh, that require intelligence. Uh, absolutely not the case, but more so the notion of AI surpassing humans in certain pointed targeted tasks uh, and and to make the training of these large models economically viable uh, we are going to have to resort to a lot of algorithmic innovation uh, if we just maintain course on current lines of thinking we are quickly going to find ourselves in a situation where our compute demands explode and we are not able to keep up uh, with realistically uh, managing uh, things at this scale. Uh, equally important will be uh, the requirement to build and deploy uh, these efficient, highly efficient scale out systems in data center. Uh, software is also going to play a very, very important role in all of this. And, and some of the challenges that the HPC world has seen historically uh, will need to be tackled by system, uh, system architects uh, and designers for AI as well. Uh, we are still, I would say, scratching the surface of, uh, of a lot of those considerations. Uh, while we talk a lot about hyper-focused, uh, being very, very hyper-focused on accelerators for AI, we generally don't talk or put a lot of emphasis on general purpose compute because that is still an important aspect of actually making use of these systems in a pragmatic fashion. Um, when it comes to host compute to AI compute, um, uh, that is typically deployed in our data center stamp, uh, we need to give uh, end users the flexibility to choose uh, the ratio of host and AI compute so that they are able to elastically scale uh, that to their liking. So, so resource disaggregation is something that we uh, very strongly believe in. So now let's look at uh, how the landscape is evolving. I, I'm sure you've seen some version of this graph uh, one way or the other uh, in, in, in the past. Uh, we're taking natural language processing uh, as an example. Uh, let's see where it all started in terms of this almost explosion of model, model size. It all started with the introduction of BERT uh, in 2018. Uh, BERT large with uh, 340 million parameters or so pioneered a revolutionary method to represent, excuse me, natural language models uh, that, that transform our architecture uh, with the multi-head attention mechanism um, became a cornerstone architecture uh, for NLP models and, and actually began, has begun to find its way into other domains such as vision as well. Uh, models such as uh, GPT-2 and GPT-3 from OpenAI uh, with up to 175 billion parameters in the case of GPT-3, uh, or other models from the likes of Microsoft and Google have continued to push the envelope uh, when it comes to model size and uh, uh, subsequently the compute requirements to train these models. Uh, 
and and the space of innovation is just is, is going to keep up or maybe even exceed the sheer amount of compute that the research community is going to have at its disposal, which is rising as well. Uh, in in the not so distant future, we are we are looking at models uh, that will be deployed in production uh, that will break the trillion parameter uh, barrier, um, which, which represents an exponential growth. Uh, the the switch C model uh, that is shown here is of particular interest. I will talk about that shortly. Uh, but before that, uh, let me address one issue of, of, of parameter size. So, so why increase the parametric capacity of models? Uh, of course, it's because larger models uh, generally produce better quality of results. And in the case of language models uh, in particular, uh, large models are more sample efficient. Uh, and what I mean by sample efficiency is, in, in simple terms, it just means that large models can be trained to a certain level of accuracy uh, with fewer samples or iterations uh, compared to their uh, to their smaller counterparts. Hence, it is better to train large models for fewer iterations rather than training smaller models all the way to convergence. And that has been articulated quite well. Uh, by researchers at OpenAI uh, in their scaling laws paper, which I highly recommend uh, for folks here who are interested to read if they haven't yet. Uh, this graph, I, I love this graph <laughs> because I made this uh, myself uh, after modeling the, the forward and backward pass flop count for a variety of transformer-based models. Uh, and, and why am I showing you this graph? Uh, simply because, uh, so that you all get an appreciation hopefully for uh, the, the, the following point, which is uh, while, while scaling models in the dense regime will continue its course for some time because that's what works today, and that paradigm is not at all sustainable in the long term. From a pure feasibility standpoint, when it comes to uh, the time to train these models uh, at reasonably reasonable cost. Uh, this graph shows the number of flops consumed in a single iteration mind you, just one iteration on a single sequence for a few representative model sizes based on the transformer architecture. Of course, you'll realize, uh, you'll recognize BERT and, and GPT, uh, but the 12 trillion, 50 trillion, and 200 trillion parameter model uh, is something uh, that I just uh, uh, created uh, a template for myself for representation. This is not uh, a commercially available uh, set of models today. Um, but as you can see, uh, the 200 trillion parameter model consumes three and a half exaflops, three and a half exaflops to process a single sequence uh, in just one training iteration. That, that's just one sequence. And as you all know, a typical training run will entail millions of such iterations with thousands of sequences uh, that are processed in parallel uh, because the sequence sizes of these uh, uh, that, that these models train on are, are quite big. So. Uh, operating in a dense regime definitely is, is, is not sustainable. Uh, another way to look at the computational costs for large models is the time to train these models. It's not a very, uh, sometimes it tends not to be a very relevant metric because uh, the time to train can be subjective as it depends a lot on the training objective for the user. Um, but here's a chart that uh, the, the GPT-3 paper from OpenAI um, uh, for reference, uh, you can find the reference below. Uh, the the bar at the extreme right, uh, which is the 175 billion parameter GPT-3 model, you'll notice that the total cost to train that model is close to 5,000 petaflop per second days. So let's just think about that number for a moment. Uh, let's say we put a 500 petaflop supercomputer to use uh, in use to train this model. It means it would take 10 days to train this model from scratch. And that assumes that that massive supercomputer gives us 100% efficiency from the hardware, which is, as you all know, is never practical. Uh, I mean, if you get 50% efficiency off peak, uh, even that would be uh, very, very reasonable for a, a computer of the scale. Uh, so at even 50% efficiency, the time to train is 20 days. And that's just one instance of a pre-training run. Imagine researchers experimenting this on a on a on a frequent basis. Uh, so uh, it just goes to show that the compute demands uh, are are extremely high. And just to give you folks an idea, 
uh, a 500 petaflop per second supercomputer based on today's technology spans multiple data center rows. So it's, it's not um, everybody's uh, bread and butter to eat. Um, and I'm not even talking about power costs yet. So what all of this informs us is that a different approach is required if you're going to have if you're going to give ourselves even a half decent chance of uh, being able to train terascale models efficiently uh, in the future. Uh, so that brings me to sparsity. Um, I have hopefully made the case for why we cannot continue to operate uh, in the dense regime. Uh, let, let's talk. Uh, let's talk about sparsity. Uh, now, since the quality of results from DNNs is generally proportional to the number of parameters in the model, uh, at least for language, uh, and will transcend to other use cases as well, one way to scale uh, that parameter count uh, and thereby model uh, quality without uh, exploding the, 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 the computational requirements is to make these models sparsely activated. Uh, so techniques such as sparsely gated a mixture of experts uh, will be required to boost parameter counts while still keeping the computational budget under control uh, so as to train these models in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, approaches that are based purely on structured sparsity, uh, call it block sparsity uh, as an example, uh, or, or that take a dependency on the underlying sparsity patterns in the data uh, we believe are not uh, going to sufficient. They, they can give a, uh, a 2x to a 4x uh, level imp uh, improvement in, in the computational costs, but what we need is an order of magnitude. And that's where sparsely activated models uh, come into the picture. And that's how, to be very honest, uh, is how our brain is structured. Like not every single neuron in our brain is fired uh, for every single activity uh, that a human uh, is engaged in. Uh, I will spend just a little bit of time on the switch transformer architecture. Uh, this this picture again taken from uh, the, the the paper from Google uh, shows that uh, this this model relies on the conditional compute concept, where every training sample sees the entire parametric state of of only a part of the model, not the entire model, but only a part of the model, which is uh, in this case happens to be the attention heads. Uh, for each of the layers of uh, the transformers. Uh, tokens uh, within a, a particular training sample are selectively uh, routed uh, to only one of the many, uh, but relatively small fully connected layers, uh, which form the backbone of a transformer layer. Uh, and that is decided based on a routing function where there is a lot of creativity and, and algorithmic innovation uh, that is still uh, playing out. Uh, and this is unlike the traditional dense approach where the FCN layer uh, is, is, is humongous and every token goes through uh, the entire fully connected layer. Uh, so that's the fundamental concept behind uh, this kind of sparsity, uh, namely uh, sparsely activated models. We've talked a lot about compute, uh, but what about memory requirements? Uh, memory capacity needs are dictated by three uh, primary components, I would say. Uh, first is the amount of memory required to hold model weights and the optimizer state. Uh, as an example, in the case of an atom optimizer, uh, there are two uh, orders of momenta uh, that need to be saved, uh, which take up a significant amount of memory. And then there's also gradient memory. And then there's memory taken up by intermediate activations for the forward and backward passes. That's a temp temporal requirement because the activations generally get thrown away uh, at the end of every iteration. And then there are also activation stashes, stashes excuse me, uh, if we employ um, a recomputation, uh, which I will not have too much time to talk about today, but that's an important technique as we think about uh, running large models as well. Uh, so what, what all of this points to is that DRAM capacity uh, will become a bottleneck uh, eventually when we try to run these uh, large models. Uh, memory costs uh, can adversely affect, affect uh, the overall TCO value proposition of a solution because uh, expensive memory like HPM can become a significant portion of the bomb relative to even the accelerators themselves, which is why uh, what we need is a well-designed memory hierarchy 
that can result in significant cost uh, and, and power savings. Unless we, of course, have large swaths of disaggregated memory that can be accessed uh, with extremely high bandwidth, uh, which today's technology does not really uh, jive with, at least for AI use cases, but that still remains an active area of research, which uh, could potentially become very viable uh, in, in, in the next few years uh, as well. So with, with the context set for what is it all about large models, what are compute and memory requirements, let's talk about uh, a, a few things about uh, the algorithms involved in, or, or rather parallelization schemes involved in mapping these very large models onto hardware accelerators um, with a limited amount of memory, because no matter how much memory we put on an accelerator, it is still not enough. Um, given the, the, the growth we are seeing. We generally sought uh, to two types of parallelism, uh, parallelism paradigms. Uh, one is model parallel and the other is data parallel. Uh, so let's start with the first one, uh, which is model parallel. Uh, what you see in this, uh, in this diagram is my uh, simplistic attempt to depict uh, the complex job of a compiler uh, and an auto partitioner to map a neural network to a bunch of uh, AI accelerators. The green circles along with the, the, the black lines uh, represent a neural network, in this case, composed of eight layers, uh, a very, very simple uh, network. Uh, when we talk about model parallelism, we generally refer to two axes along which we can break the model. One is the layer axis, uh, which assigns different layers to different accelerators. And the other dimension is the tensor dimension where a single layer is, uh, or a set of layers uh, potentially, uh, need to be further broken up uh, to map to one or more accelerators. Uh, and this is necessary when the layer itself is too large to fit in the memory of a single accelerator. Uh, in the case of large models, uh, we do generally resort, have to resort to uh, a, a combination of both of these approaches. And that's what this picture is trying to depict. Uh, the red dotted lines show the layer-wise split. Uh, oftentimes, uh, when we decompose models in this fashion, we employ pipelining uh, because we don't want to keep resources idle uh, and, and ensure maximum utilization. Uh, as a result of this, I'm calling this dimension uh, the, or the horizontal dimension as the pipelined uh, model parallel dimension, uh, whereas the blue dotted line shows the tensor axis uh, or, or what people sometimes call as the tensor sharding axis as well, which is the other model parallel uh, paradigm, the tensor model parallel uh, concept. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the scheme uh, divides the model into 16 uh, partitions, mapping to 16 accelerators, uh, which are represented by these, these yellow uh, circles or yellow ellipses. Uh, needless to say, uh, the load balancing amongst all of these accelerators is a big concern. Uh, models that are very, very structured or highly regular, uh, employ highly regular structures are easy in that aspect uh, because there is a reasonably clean way uh, to decompose the model. The transformer is a perfect case uh, for, for this, um, given that the attention heads are, are generally equal in size. Uh, but there are other model architectures such as CNNs that become very difficult uh, to decompose given that they are not as regular. So uh, there's also, as a result of this, um, one has to be very, very mindful of the communication costs involved uh, in, in these model parallel scenarios. They tend to be uh, much more pronounced in the tensor model parallel axis as opposed to the pipeline uh, model parallel axis. So that would be a way to decompose uh, just, just one uh, replica of a model. But oftentimes when we deal with scale, we generally stamp out uh, multiple such replicas in, a, in what the industry commonly refers to as the data parallel uh, axes. So uh, taking the same example as before, uh, this is how uh, a single replica of 16 accelerators can be stamped out. Uh, this also brings in additional sources of communications overhead, uh, which namely is the, uh, is the amount of uh, communication involved in gradient 
uh, reductions amongst all of these data parallel uh, model replicas. Uh, there is definitely uh, there are definitely opportunities to exploit even more parallelism by overlapping computation of the forward and backward pass uh, of a certain iteration with the uh, with the gradient already used for uh, a different part of the model or a different iteration. Uh, but all of those schemes need to be very very carefully managed uh, because it has a large impact on model uh, convergence. Uh, I will not again talk too much about these overlap capabilities, but for now, most of the schemes that are in production do not uh, do that level of overlap. Moving on, um, uh, the, we, we often uh, do not pay too much uh, emphasis on an aspect of training these mega models, uh, which is very, very important, and that is uh, batch size. Uh, in, a, in a typical mini batch uh, SGD or stochastic gradient decent uh, training run, uh, the problem with increasing batch size uh, unscrupulously uh, is that uh, the number of gradient updates uh, reduces when the global batch size for a given number of tokens uh, that the model uh, is trained on increases. Uh, so, so there is a global batch size constraint, which in turn imposes a local batch size constraint on each of these replicas that I showed um, in the earlier picture, uh, especially when we are dealing with uh, large clusters of AI accelerators uh, that comprise of hundreds or possibly even thousands of accelerators. So uh, in general, what this implies is that larger model replicas are generally more favorable uh, and, and definitely any architecture that uh, takes a dependency on increasing batch size to improve the teraflop efficiency on the device will be at a distinct disadvantage in this realm, uh, given the batch size constraint. So now let's turn our attention to what this all means to the buildup of a typical uh, data center system. Um, what is shown here is that Besides uh, our, our regular compute storage and networking stamps, uh, AI compute uh, is going to take up a significant space allocation in the data center of the future. At least that's what our uh, belief is and that's what our uh, customer base is telling us as well. Uh, the, the, the core capabilities that govern the deployment and lifecycle management of just regular compute, general purpose compute, uh, such as resource in initialization, uh, multi-tenancy, elastic job uh, scale management uh, will just be, will, will be just as important to manage for AI compute in the future uh, as it is for general purpose compute today. And a lot of these needs uh, uh, will be different for different model architectures, which is why coming back to the previous point I made, uh, it is very important for us to provide users the flexibility to manage the general purpose compute versus AI compute ratio so that they can independently uh, scale those. Another important aspect to all of this is uh, automation. Uh, users demand automation. It, it is probably practical to manually place models on systems with maybe four or eight or 16 accelerators. But beyond that, uh, especially when we are talking about supercomputer scale, uh, where, where we are talking about thousands of accelerators, automation is a must. Nobody is going to hand map uh, models onto accelerators uh, and, and do that in a flexible way so that they, it fosters experimentation. Um, so, so the result of that, the compiler and the auto partitioner is going to be uh, extremely uh, prominent in, in this space going forward. So, with all of that context laid, um, I want to spend some time talking about graph code technology. Um, but before going into details on the technology itself, uh, let me send, uh, spend some time on what our core design principles entail. Uh, so first and foremost of which being, we are designing for scale. Uh, we are not uh, looking at individual accelerators, what we, we take a more holistic approach where we look at how uh, a large cluster of these accelerators would work. So that is a core fundamental principle for us. Uh, what we also believe is in is that uh, a large distributed on-chip SRAM uh, minimizes data movement uh, to and fro uh, uh, from external memory, uh, which 
is a better uh, prospect for achieving higher performance per watt because power is going to play an important role in, in systems of the future as well. Power consumption, I mean. Uh, and then that same concept also extends to uh, better exploitation of data locality uh, because uh, it relieves pressure on external DRAM bandwidth uh, because if you have a large on-chip SRAM, uh, we can keep a lot more uh, a, a significantly bigger portion of the uh, parametric state, as an example of the model, on chip itself. So uh, we don't need uh, techniques like or technologies like high bandwidth memory to use external memory uh, efficiently. Uh, and finally, uh, interconnect uh, is also ex extremely important. Uh, we need to uh, have a balanced interconnect that transcends uh, not just a system of four or eight chips but uh, goes to a rack uh, scale and even beyond rack scale. Uh, because oftentimes, uh, communications uh, are, are the biggest bottlenecks in, in uh, running large models. Uh, so let's dig into graph core technology a little bit. Um, what, what, uh, with the scale and, 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 and flexibility requirements in mind, uh, what we decided very early on, uh, again, in our product journey, was to take a modular approach towards building AI systems. Uh, this picture shows the smallest unit of compute in that uh, 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 layer cake almost, uh, or that modular design concept. Uh, that comes in the form of what we call the intelligence processing unit or IPU in short. Uh, built in seven nanometer technology in today's generation. Uh, this happens to be our second generation. Uh, this chip is a behemoth of sorts. Um, it's one of the largest chips manufactured uh, on this node, if not the largest. Um, packs in about 60 billion transistors or so. And uh, it's a massively parallel MIMD machine, like I said earlier, with 1,472 independent processing cores. Uh, each of these cores um, or tiles, as we refer to, uh, has a tightly coupled SRAM, which is in this generation 624 uh, kibibytes per core that can be accessed uh, very, very deterministically um, in uh, from a programmer standpoint in uh, six cycles in today's generation, or, or actually one logical clock uh, cycle from a programmer standpoint, but six uh, clock cycle. Uh, the core itself is barrel threaded, uh, which is based on, uh, which, which has six worker threads that are scheduled on a uh, round robin basis. And there is also a supervisor thread that orchestrates all of this. Uh, each core uh, uh, has a highly efficient a floating point unit uh, that is capable of performing uh, IEEE FP16 operations and also uh, FP32 operations that uh, results in a cumulative um, 300 teraflops uh, per second uh, performance per chip, and that is peak. Uh, the total amount of SRAM uh, gets close to 900 megabytes in this generation, which is by far uh, the largest on-chip SRAM that is available for AI chips. Uh, on a per chip basis uh, in today's world. And all of that is accessible um, in uh, uh, at, at a bandwidth of uh, 47 terabytes per second uh, for data operands. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, by the way, uh, the chip uh, that we uh, had introduced uh, about 18 months ago. We do have uh, a recent revision to this chip architecture, which I will talk about uh, next. We also have an on-chip uh, exchange, uh, uh, which is essentially a, a network on-chip, a massive network on-chip, which yields a cumulative bandwidth of eight terabytes per second uh, and allows for non-blocking data transfers. Uh, that facilitates our chip level parallelization scheme, uh, which is uh, the bulk synchronous parallel paradigm uh, that comprises of a data exchange phase followed by a computational phase uh, and then a synchronization barrier to keep all of the, uh, the tiles in sync. Uh, BSP in short has been relied upon for big data applications in the past. Uh, we are the first company to bring that um, to the forefront in a hardware context on an actual functioning uh, accelerator uh, chip. Uh, 
There's also external connectivity that we worry about, uh, which is why we bring out IPU links. Uh, in this generation, 10 of these IPU links that facilitate chip-to-chip -chip connectivity, giving a, an aggregate bandwidth of 320 gigabytes per second, full duplex uh, per chip. And then the host connectivity is provided by uh, a PCI Gen 4 link uh, by eight uh, in, in, in today's generation. Uh, last month, uh, we introduced a, uh, a new product that is based on the same underlying technology for the, uh, for the AI chip itself, uh, but uh, that had an enhanced power delivery mechanism uh, by employing what we call a wafer on wafer manufacturing uh, process. Uh, that we worked very closely with TSMC uh, to bring to the market. Uh, we are the first semiconductor manufacturing manufacturer uh, that has brought to production a, uh, a chip that is based on uh, the wafer on wafer uh, 3D stacking concept. Um, in, in this generation, uh, what we are doing is stacking two wafers on top of each other that are bonded by uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, parallelized um, uh, TSVs or through silicon vias. One of those wafers is our logic wafer, uh, uh, which is essentially identical as uh, the, the the chip uh, architecture that I uh, that has the uh, same chip architecture that uh, I mentioned in the previous slide. But then the second wafer is uh, a you can call it a power delivery wafer, uh, which has uh, a, essentially a set of uh, deep trench capacitors that provide a better power distribution to the uh, logic wafer uh, that I talked about earlier. And uh, what this uh, power distribution uh, allows us to do is increase reliably the frequency on uh, the chip. Uh, and as a result of which, we get uh, a 40% performance boost uh, relative to uh, the, the product that we have uh, op, uh, that we introduced. Uh, 18 months ago in the market. So this is 40% additional performance without any change to any logic components on the chip. This is purely through better power delivery. And as you can see, the numbers here say, uh, uh, speak for themselves, going from 250 teraflops per second to 350 teraflops per second. Uh, I just realized I may have misspoken uh, on the previous slides. Uh, I may have said 300, but it's actually 350 teraflops of AI float performance. This is uh, FP16 performance. Uh, the memory bandwidth to the on-chip SRAM also increases to 65 terabytes per second. And the all-to-all -all exchange uh, that I talked about earlier also gets a boost going to 11.4 uh, terabytes per second. This product is available uh, in the market today. Uh, and we believe it's, uh, it, it's going to be uh, in, uh, the first in a series of products that we'll introduce using a uh, similar paradigm. At the system level, we assemble four of these, uh, these chips onto a single 1U chassis, which we are calling the Bow 2000 uh, today. Uh, this is the smallest unit in our modular building block stack uh, that uh, programmers can target. Uh, aside, besides the four IPUs, we also have a, uh, a proxy host on this chassis, which we are calling the gateway, uh, which provides boot functionality to the IPUs and also uh, is a conduit for host connectivity. That host, uh, which is typically an x86 based server, runs our popular software stack. Uh, the proxy host also allows for uh, expand, memory expansion in the form of uh, what we're calling exchange memory which is offered through up to 256 gigabytes of uh, DRAM, uh, DDR4 DRAM in today's generation that can be accessed for things like uh, optimizer state or even model parameters uh, in, in the future uh, for efficiently running a large, uh, large deep neural network models. Uh, this is again a one new blade uh, form factor. Uh, the host connectivity is 100 gigabit uh, Ethernet. Uh, and then there's also for cross rack connectivity, uh, 200 gig uh, Ethernet links that, uh, that uh, get out of the gateway chip, uh, which uh, allows users to create a, a cross network 
or any network topology of their choice for that matter uh, to create a cluster at the data center scale uh, out of these IPUs or IPU machines, I should say. Uh, the IPU systems uh, come in in, in a, a few pre-can configurations that we have qualified. Um, the to start off with, uh, we have here the Bopart 64, which is 64 of our IPU accelerator chips, and that typically takes up a rack, uh, and then we can stamp out multiple such units uh, to create Bot 256 or a Bot 1024 uh, type configurations. Uh, which people can use for AI models at scale. Uh, I have talked about uh, our disaggregated approach towards things. Uh, this slide actually depicts uh, the architecture uh, where on the top left, uh, you can see compute resources uh, that can scale elastically. They can come um, in, in various shapes and sizes. They can be either bare metal servers, they can be uh, virtual machines uh, running in a cloud, uh, or, or they could be containerized uh, uh, workloads that run on bare metal or virtual machines, uh, uh, and they can, they can be scaled independently of the accelerators. Uh, so support for multi-tenancy is just, uh, just, just comes naturally. Uh, this is especially useful in a hybrid uh, cloud type environment where a customer could leverage uh, these host compute resources from let's say cloud vendor A, uh, they could put their own IPUs or accelerator resources uh, that sit on the primary data center network uh, in that same data center, and they can attach a storage solution from uh, a different cloud uh, or a different storage provider. Um, for example, we have qualified a few uh, storage vendors. So this, uh, in effect, shows the value of uh, or the power of disaggregation that we are uh, very excited about. Um, Going back to my earlier description of uh, model decomposition strategies, uh, this picture tries to depict how this all comes together in an actual example of how a live model is mapped onto IPU pod systems. Uh, the tensor shard dimension that I'm showing here uh, in this example uh, spans uh, the, the rack or uh, let's say a pod 64 for argument's sake. The pipeline dimension uh, spans multiple such racks uh, where uh, the layers or a set of layers communicate from one rack communicate to another rack through uh, uh, the, the gateway link topology that I had talked about. Uh, and then model replicas can be stamped out, uh, presumably uh, along data center row granularity uh, to map uh, a large model onto a data center scale. Uh, talking about parallelization schemes is very easy. Um, uh, it all comes down to, uh, it, that all looks great on paper, but it all comes down to putting into practice um, the complexity of the compiler stack and the automation frameworks for partitioning. This, this slide tries to depict the complexity that the compiler has to deal with, uh, starting all the way from the chip which has 1400 odd cores uh, with a non-blocking network on, on, on the chip to uh, the M2000 machine that has four of these IPUs with uh, four times those many cores with a ring topology to a pod 64 that has a two dimensional torus uh, and then scaling beyond that to a pod, let's say uh, 64K that has thousands of these IPUs which has a hybrid network topology. So all this, all that I'm trying to say here is that all of this uh, comes in a completely different optimization space as far as the compiler is concerned because uh, the, 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 top, the network topology, the compute scale, uh, and also uh, the, the, the method to map models is, is very different in all of these cases. Uh, just shows uh, that the compiler and the auto partitioner has to keep up. Uh, Multi-tenancy is very important uh, because we talk about large clusters, but there is oftentimes uh, pretty much no scenario where that large cluster is available for just one user uh, to prescribe to all the time. Uh, so I'm not going to spend uh, too much time on this slide in the interest of time, uh, but all this shows is that uh, we offer multi-tenancy both at the host compute level and also at the IPU uh, compute level to make the life of a data center manager easy. 
the software stack is extremely important. Uh, this just shows uh, that we have support for all the major machine learning frameworks that uh, practitioner, researchers and practitioners typically resort to, uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and the abstraction layers that sit on top of that, like Keras, PyTorch, Light, Lightning, et cetera. Uh, as the backbone or the foundation layer, uh, that powers all of these uh, uh, or sits underneath all of these frameworks is our popular software stack, uh, which offers a set of libraries for linear algebra acceleration or communications, uh, primitives acceleration, things like random number generation libraries, sparse libraries, uh, and uh, fundamentally is rooted uh, or, or based on our graph compiler uh, that takes uh, a graph that is represented at a high level in one of these machine learning frameworks and takes it through a series of uh, graph transformations uh, down to the very lowest layer of abstraction that talks straight to the hardware, eventually boiling down to the, uh, to the, the code gen uh, piece of the compiler. So all of that is provided by us. Um, and our goal in all of this is to make the life of the developer very easy. Uh, from a system software standpoint, we also have support for a resource management uh, constructs or frameworks like Kubernetes, uh, Slurm, uh, we support uh, a variety of observability tools such as uh, Prometheus and Grafana. And for manageability, we do have support for uh, the open BMC standards uh, that are your usual suspects uh, as well. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to our developers. Uh, we have a rich and thriving developer community. There are several ways uh, you can get access to models uh, that are in the public domain that run just out of the box. Uh, in GraphCore, uh, it also allows uh, developers to innovate by themselves uh, by taking these models as baselines and uh, creating their own uh, versions or flavors of it. Uh, we also have a developer portal, which I will not go into the details of uh, in today's talk, but uh, whoever is interested is uh, very welcome to access that. And uh, then finally, I want to close the talk with uh, the the su uh, summary and some key takeaways uh, and and the first and foremost of those being uh, that we are not in the business of creating another GPU or a GPU clone. Uh, there are other players uh, in the market that are already at it. We wish them nothing uh, but success. Our goal is to create a disruptive architecture that allows researchers and practitioners another tool in their arsenal when it comes to AI. So our fine-grained parallelism uh, paradigm, we believe, unlocks uh, new capabilities for emerging AI models, um, and as a result of which our IPU pod systems uh, are able to offer a platform for innovation. Uh, our systems are elastically scalable uh, and are cost effective. Uh, and all in all, uh, if there is one uh, call to action that I would like to emphasize uh, today is uh, a call out to all of you to come uh, and innovate with us. Uh, we are here to explore new frontiers uh, in, in AI uh, spanning multiple domains. And we are looking for partners who can actually help us and get to a world where uh, AI becomes uh, ubiquitous. Uh, with that, uh, I come to the end of my talk. I would like to thank uh, Vlad and others at NCSA one more time uh, for giving me the opportunity. Thanks also to Chad, who uh, facilitated all of this. Um, here's my email address uh, for anybody to contact me after the talk. Uh, but for now, I'll just uh, open up uh, for questions. I believe we have eight minutes. So I'll be happy to take questions. Yeah, Saurabh, thank you very much um, uh, for this in very informative presentation. Are there any questions? Yeah, may I ask a question? Yeah, go sure, ahead. sure. Yeah, listen, hi. Um, I had a question, like uh, I'm particularly interested in two different, uh, um, different data types, right? So as, if, as you know, today in the uh, bottom layer, um, uh, people are not just using the existing data type, either from GPU or, or AI accelerator. Um, Recently, like uh, NVIDIA, uh, where they already released a new data type, like a flow, float A um, for coming GPU. I think that the stuff is already being explored by IBM like uh, three, four years back, right? 
So um, my question related to that, also I might be interested to explore float four, for example. Mm -hmm. So a lot of innovation, basically driven by the same motivation, lower power, lower, pre um, lower precision, but the, with higher accuracy, right? Uh, it's like a human brain, right? You, you don't need to mm, yeah. very high um, yeah. uh, precision to do all the AI work. So I, I'm, a, I'm a just uh, interested to know for, for this mm -hmm. work, um, GraphCore, um, I think I, I Googled it. Graph code does support float A probably, but I don't see a lot of um, information. For example, can, can, can we train or have you trained a um, transformer, for example, BERT with, with your float A? Um, how, how did you do that? Like, reason is NVIDIA specifically released something called a transformer engine um, last week to, in their words, they use that to accommodate the float A formatting in their new GPU to make a model converge faster or better. Um, do you have any information on your end? If you have float A, how you handle that? That's first part of the question. The second part, are you planning for float four or do you give customer a flexibility in, or configurable data formatting to, to do the AI work? So, yeah, that's a, that's a good, good question. Um, I'll address the float eight part first. So we at GraphCore have a research team, uh, a fairly big research team that is focused on uh, uh, furthering research in lower precision arithmetic. Uh, we were the first ones to introduce float 16 with stochastic rounding support, which allows us to store master weights in 16-bit format as opposed to 32-bit format, which most other uh, AI players do. Uh, specifically with respect to float 8 support, we do not have hardware support for float 8 in our current generation product. Uh, we are not in a position to say publicly what our plans with respect to lower precision uh, arithmetic are at this time. Uh, however, um, uh, if we can get an NDA in place, we'd be happy to discuss this further with you. Uh, on a confidential basis. Uh, lower precision arithmetic is, is, is an area of research that is uh, um, uh, front and center of what we are doing as well. Uh, but in, in today's world, we do not have hardware support for Float 8. Uh, you also asked about uh, Float 4. Uh, so I think the response is very similar. Um, I think if uh, you're interested, uh, we can get into an NDA and then uh, potentially talk about our, our uh, plans in that in that realm. Uh, speaking of the transformer engine, though, I will just say one thing. Uh, there are techniques that can be uh, essentially implemented even on the hardware that we uh, deployed today. Uh, it is just a different uh, mix of uh, floating point uh, precision. So whatever NVIDIA has talked about in terms of the transformer engine, uh, we have opportunities to do the same, uh, except for it will be at uh, different uh, arithmetic precision or different ways of trying to get the same benefits out of a native float uh, implementation in hardware. Uh, I hope that answered um, at least part of the question. Uh, I'm happy to discuss this uh, further uh, on a more confidential basis. Sure, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? So I have a question. So um, the the software stack that you have, uh, how how um, so if somebody is developing in PyTorch or, or TensorFlow, how how um, is there anything unique that they need to do to be able to use your hardware? That's a great question. So uh, I do not have any specific code examples here today, but uh, we are more than happy to share with you offline mm -hmm. some examples. The short answer is that. Uh, for a, a large array of models, uh, the amount of effort that a developer needs to put in today to make a PyTorch or a TensorFlow model work on the IPU is minimal. I mean, the, the code changes required are minimal. We have uh, a few examples that show the number of lines that need to change when somebody has a model that has been uh, already optimized for GPUs to make that work on IPU is literally uh, two or three lines of code changes. Uh, of course, this is model dependent. Uh, some of the more complex models that are uh, hand-tuned even for NVIDIA architectures will need some more effort. But I would say for the mundane model, the run-of-the-mill models, 
uh, it, it is a very easy port. And that is uh, apparent from our model garden, which you, uh, which I'll also send you a pointer to. And yeah. we'll send you some examples, yeah. Yeah, on, on a related question. So are any of these tools available sort of to try without the hardware, like for example, being able to you know, process the model uh, with your compiler and then get some, uh, some estimations in, you know, in terms of performance or power or you know, any of the characteristics that, that are important? Yeah, are, are you saying uh, instead of having direct access to ITU hardware? Uh, is mm -hmm. that what your question is? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so yeah, we, we do have, uh, uh, we don't talk about a whole lot, uh, but we do have a simulator that mm -hmm. one can target the compilation to. Uh, we can discuss offline uh, how we can go about giving you access mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to that engine. Uh, otherwise, there is. Uh, we also offer IPU access in the cloud for uh, trial or an evaluation period. Uh, we offer a two-week free trial for graph, what we call graph cloud, uh, which is IPUs in a cloud-like consumption model. Mm -hmm. um, do, do, do you have some sort of a collection of uh, models which are already ported and uh, sort of? Absolutely, we absolutely have. Uh, we have a a model garden uh, mm -hmm. that uh, I believe, yeah, that's this is the last link uh, will take you there and we'll share uh, the slides and the mm -hmm. uh, actual link with you offline as well. So that has a collection of models spanning natural language processing, computer vision, graph neural networks, um, object detection, and, and a few other uh, mm -hmm. model types that just work out of the box, yeah. So you also mentioned it so that you have, you, you support a couple of modalities of how it can be used. So you, you support Kubernetes and you support uh, Slurm environments. How, how, how exactly, so suppose Slurm, so Slurm is something that is very popular here for our HPC systems. How exactly do you, you know, do you use it with Slurm? You, you can schedule individual chip or you can schedule it some part on the chip or? Yeah, yeah. So today uh, we treat a collection of four chips or that chassis, the one new chassis that I talked about as a unit of compute that is scheduled. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we can definitely talk about scheduling on an individual chip basis, uh, but uh, our cust most of our customers are happy with this uh, with this level of uh, job, uh, job scheduling, mm -hmm. which happens at four IPU granularity. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, any other questions? You, you probably just can have one more question in case somebody has some urgent need to ask. Okay, if not, well, thank you very much. We really appreciate you taking time to uh, present about your system uh, to us. And uh, uh, you know, hopefully we'll continue this conversation. Uh, I do have a student uh, who is looking at the switch transformers uh, that, that, that you mentioned it um, in, in your sort of motivational part, why this is important. And so it would be really interesting to see how well that, that implementation works in your system and uh, how fast my student can sort of iterate through different iteration experiments with this, this, this model. So maybe we Absolutely. can talk about that. We, yeah, definitely we can continue the conversation offline. Uh, thank you again for uh, the opportunity. Uh, I had a good time talking to you all. Looking okay, forward to a collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.